Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our summer lunchtime Bible study. Um, there's an interesting thing that happens in all of our texts today, and that Sometimes we don't see God big enough. We see God as big, but or in there, and there's a, there's a sense that we have an understanding. But I don't think sometimes we really see God big enough in all of our texts today, that in each case, what the writers, what the, especially in the Gospel of John and Ephesians, but also Exodus, they're trying to draw people into thinking about God in such a way that isn't quite so um, transactional, right? That if I do this, then that will happen, right? It's very economic-based. Um, and we have a tendency to treat relationships as economy, right? Um, if I do this, then you'll do that. When we do that with, with God, <laughs> we don't see him as big enough. And when we do that, we reduce God down to simply that transaction. So that's the only thing that is... some information. My, my microphone is being a little staticky, it says, so, we'll, so hopefully that'll... I'm cutting out a little bit. My sound engineer in the other congregation is helping with this. Uh, so it's an interesting thing because we have this relationship and we tend to minimize it, make it smaller. Um, we tend to reduce it to um, something that makes sense to us, which tends to um, limit who God is and what God does. And so today, what I want you to uh, as we think about this as we're working through the various texts, see what's going on with that with this minimization of who God is and what God can do. And we'll, we'll go from there. And um, it's, I just, it's, a, it's a fascinating collection. So we start with Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 4. And the nine plagues that are mentioned there. Exodus chapter 16. Where we are in the story of the book of Exodus is really interesting because they literally have just gotten themselves out of Egypt, right? They've just been let out of Egypt. And so it should be, right? Boy, oh, that's not coming through at all. There, that seems to be a little better. Try that again. I'm gonna see. This is these are the difficulties of of all of this in the modern stuff. All right. So, literally, they've just got themselves out of Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea. We've had the song of Moses and the song of Miriam, literally in chapter 15. And here we are in Exodus chapter 16. There's three. about not having something to drink. That's what happens first. Like, oh, we don't have any water. The water that's there is bitter. And so first thing they've got to do is they've got to make the bitter water sweet. Right? And then when we get to 16, when we get to verse 2, they've come to the wilderness. The water is turned to sweet. And now they're on to the next thing to complain about. 
it's, 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 exactly it. it's, it's hilarious because you're thinking, uh, hello, what's your problem? You've just been released from bondage. You're liberated. But here's the thing. In Exodus, there are three places the scholars kind of talk about that where you can find the Israelites. They're in Egypt in the promised land or they're in the wilderness right now there's a problem with being in the wilderness and that is it's an in-between place it's a vague place that's not usually well defined all right it's a place that you're trying to get through not safe right and so the wilderness is always this um it's an in-between place it's not comfortable. It's the meantime. It's on the way. It's the every kid in the backseat of the car saying, are we there yet? That's where they're at. They're in the are we there yet stage. And they're going to be there for a long time. Well, what that means is that not there yet means that it's really uncomfortable. And so even if they were confronted by the same things that they're confronted with here, not enough good drinking water, Food, if they were in a place, right, they might have been able to sort that out a little bit more comfortably, a little bit more, uh, well, with a lot less complaining. But because they don't know where they're going, they don't know when they're going to get there, every problem becomes magnified, doesn't it? When we don't know, when we're uncertain, we are just absolutely frustrated by every little thing. Doesn't matter what it is, right? And they're going to take it out on the one who they see as the one who brought them to this place in the first place. It's Moses, it's Aaron, and then God. God, why did you do this to us? And they're going to shake their fist at Moses and Aaron and say, why did you do this to us? And they're like, hey, you know, I'm just doing what I was, you know, instructed to do. I was doing what I was called to do. And, but who they're really angry with, who they're really frustrated with, is God. And ultimately, it's not surprising. Um, you're wandering out in the wilderness. You don't have anything. So, yeah, having water to drink, kind of important. Having food to eat. Also very important. But what's interesting is that it's like they have no ability to say, okay, but at least we're not back there. In fact, they do the exact opposite, don't they? Yeah, at least back there we had food to eat. And as the journey gets longer, they're on days gone by becomes bigger right yeah i mean the you know we had meat we had you know melons and leeks and you know all of stuff all of, they're they're remembering everything that they used to have but they're missing out they were slaves <laughs> they were not free right so, yes you had a square meal, I guess, but you also had no freedom. You had, you were not, you were stuck. But what's really interesting is that they turned that into a golden age. Oh, things were so much better when. Really? Were they? Really? If that's what you're looking at, you're missing something, if that's the case. And so they complain, and they're frustrated. Because they're stuck where they're going. And they don't know when they're going to get there. And they really wish that God would make things clear. And why didn't you tell us beforehand if it was going to be like this? And so all the complaining isn't really about Moses. Because Moses usually comes off saying, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't you know. When they are thirsty, he goes, I, do, I, I can't get you anything. Let me go ask God. Food, I, there's nothing I can do about that. Let me go ask God. And so they're really starting to show that their frustration is with God himself. 
And what's really interesting, of course, is then God's like, fine. If this is the way it is, then I'll make sure that, you know, all of this, you know, that good things happen. So especially when we're looking at the, um, look to like verse 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And so what we're getting, what we're understanding is that God does hear them. He knows what's going on. Probably a little bit less on the complaining side, right? But then what does God do? God provides bread and meat. And what's interesting is the phrase that is used, right? Look in verse 4. I'm kind of hopping around a little bit. That's okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is verse 4, chapter 16, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. Right? Now, that's a very specific word choice. Whenever God makes it rain, things happen. Significant things happen. Significant change happens. There are really only a few times when God says it's going to rain. Creation and the flood. And so what is happening is that this is an act of God's creative movement, right? Make it rain. Now, here's the other thing about it. This isn't just any bread, although they'll complain about this soon enough, right? Oh, we have only manna to eat. Yeah, what a hardship. Bread from heaven. Because as we're going to see in just a second, the psalm for this week, just bread that God, you know, lays out for them, which he does. I mean, it's not like he makes it very hard for them, right? It, it literally, they wake up and it's like dew on the ground. You just have to go and pick it up. Likewise, when he sends the quails, right? They, they just flock into the camp. It's not like they even have to go outside of the campsite, right? It's like they're literally dropping them on your table, but what's really interesting about that is that this is food from heaven. It's what the psalmist will say. The angels eat this food. That's what manna is, what the angels eat. So it's not like God is giving them scraps or leftovers. God is offering them what the angels themselves eat. Right? But it also makes sense in a, in a way because the people of Israel, their complaining makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we understand that they should be more, should have greater gratitude. But it's hard for us sometimes, in the middle of a crisis, to not see that the immediate needs get met. I mean, when we're in the middle of something, we just want to get through that. And sometimes it's harder to see the bigger picture. And so it's easy for us to kind of boss up about Israel. It really is. We're like, oh, come on, you guys, you were just literally. But we do the same thing. Because what happens is that all we can see is what's right in front of us. The immediate need. The, the problem that's right there. And so the bigger picture evaporates down into that thing that's just sitting there right in front of us. Um, which gives us some, I think, compassion. They're no different than us. But God is calling them to see the bigger picture. Right? It's okay to understand it's, we understand that people have concerns, they're immediate, all that kind of stuff, and that's true, and we have compassion and empathy and sympathy for that kind of situation, but at the same point, God really does want us to see the bigger picture. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, 
We're supposed to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have a tendency not to be able to do that because it's something just absolutely, we, we put blinders on and we can't see beyond the immediate crisis and its resolution. And what I'm saying is that I'm with you in the immediate crisis. I'm with you in this particular moment of concern. We will get through this. But I do need you to see the longer view, the bigger picture. And that's hard. It is hard. I, I, I don't think there's anything about that that we can't sympathize with. But it's also we're supposed to be challenged into doing, into, into not losing track. It's a thing to think about, right? Now, what's really interesting, of course, is that when we flip to the psalm for this Sunday, Psalm 78, um, verses 23 through 29. Now, I have to tell you something. When you have the opportunity, go ahead and read the whole thing, right? Um, All of Psalm 78, right? Read the whole thing. Obviously not right now, but sometime this week. <laughs> Do that. It is one of the historical psalms. And so what we're going to get is a very condensed version of the Exodus story. All of it. Right there in um, pretty straightforward verse. Now the interesting thing about that is that it uses this period of the history of the people of Israel to talk about the God's faithfulness. That God, even in the midst of all of those troubles, never gave up on the people of Israel. Although, <laughs> that said, if you read the rest of the psalm, it's really kind of tough, right? It's very harsh. There are moments thinking, well, God doesn't sound like he's got a whole lot of patience for the people of Israel. Right. He didn't. God did have a great deal of patience because they were acting so badly. Um, and there's a reason why we only read so much of it on Sunday morning, because if we read a little bit more of it on Sunday morning, frankly, it might make people sitting in the pews really uncomfortable. Because we read 23 through 29. Those are glorious, right? Yet he commanded the skies and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate of the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall within their camp, all around their dwellings, and they ate, and they were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. Right? And that's what we get on Sunday. Follow along with me just a little bit farther. But before they had satisfied their cravings, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he killed the strongest of them, and laid low the flower of Israel. Oh, <laughs> okay. Now I know why we probably don't read that on Sunday mornings. Because God's like, okay, now you're happy. You got full bellies, now you're happy. You're still missing the point. Right? <laughs> and, and because this is a time when things were a little bit tougher, things are a little harsher, things are a little bit more rough, um, we hear that God's reaction to the people wasn't always okay. I'm going to show my um, patience and um, not read my wrath against you. And this is like, oh, yeah, wrath. Um, it makes us uncomfortable. It really makes us uncomfortable in the modern world when we don't think of God in that way. Yep. 32 says, in. in his wonders. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. 
When he killed them, they sought for him. They repented and sought God earnestly. And there's, yeah, yep. And, and we see this often in the Hebrew scriptures where God is like, they're not learning, not learning. And so the lessons get sharper. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, well, it's like, you know, if, if, if this is the, the, the journey, you know, through the wilderness, right? Um, place in the Sinai Peninsula called the Wilderness of Sin. Um, and it's not actually sin. It's, it's if you go back and find the actual spelling, it's T-S-I-N, sin. Um, it's just a place name. It's not actually anything. But it does remind us that sinning itself can feel like wilderness. Because it is. It's, it's essentially the wrong way or the way that we've lost track of. But on those long journeys that we used to take, and we'd be sitting in the backseat of our cars, and our parents are like, you know, we'd be complaining. Oh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, it gets out of hand until the parent finally says, do you need me to pull this car over? I'll pull it over right now, and we'll have this conversation. God is, in this psalm and in the book of Exodus, always needing to say, I'm going to pull the car over right now. And somebody is going to learn this lesson the hard way, right? And, and we think, where did God go, right? Well, interestingly enough, God's desire never changes. Because God's desire is to get us to do the law, right? To live according to ways that God's had, you know, done all of this. How he expected us to live. And so it's really understandable that God will look for new ways. Maybe, right, God sorts out, the wrath wasn't working. But you still have to make it clear. You have to point it out. And so what we get in the psalm is a reminder that the one thing that God wants for us is for us to get it. Here, here. And then not just to get it, but then to live it. Right? God is going to go to every length possible for us to finally get it into our heads that this is the best way to live. That following the law, right? Doing what we've been called to actually makes things better. Right? Um, and not just for us, but for God is finding ways without, you know, a, a you know a reprisal of you know let's do the whole flood the world again and start over, you know. So in, God promised not to do that again, right? God tried that once. Guess what? Realized. That was not the great way to go about this, right? And so the whole story of the flood is God saying, that probably wasn't going to be the best way to work, right? And so there's an interesting thing that we see the persistence of God in all of this, but also that God is going to realize that of learning the lesson. Um, now, some of this may just be wishful thinking. <laughs> but ultimately, I think it's about the fact that, that God does see that we need to hear this lesson over and over and over again. 
because we're a forgetting people. We know what we're supposed to do, just don't always do it. All right, which really is interesting because that leads us to our second lesson. The Ephesians lesson for this week is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. So it's Ephesians 4, chapter, uh, or verses 1 through 16. And this is, again, it's a, because it's in Ephesians, we know this text really well, but let me read the very beginning of this. And this is, obviously, um, we'll unpack this as we go. Paul writes, right, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, thank you to life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope in your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 1 says, This is the God and Father of all, who is above all and through all. To this text, right? And what's really important is that the beginning of chapter 4 really is the core of the letter to the Ephesians. Um, Ephesians is not particularly long, right? Um, but it's got two major parts. The first part really is about. Working, right, to understand that these Gentile Christians, which is who the Ephesians are, they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. And so the first half of chapter 4 is about the Gentiles. The letter to the Ephesians is saying to the Gentiles, you are a part of the family of God. Right? You may be um, from a different part of the world than where Christianity is. The Ephesians, Asia Minor, into Greece, modern day, right? That's where the gospel is moving. Um, so even though you are brand new to the faith, you're a part of the family of God. Even though you have not been connected to this whole long history of the people of Israel, doesn't mean that you're not a part of the body of Christ. So that's the first half of the book of Ephesians. The second half is going to be Body of Christ, and so that's the whole reference is is that um, if the Gentiles and the Jews, right? And this is where we get the other language from some of the other texts. Neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, all are one in Christ. And right at the very beginning of this is that we're one big family, we're one body of Christ, and so knowing knowing that this. New folks and the old folks of this, you know, body of Christ are all one. All right. So what does that mean for how we live? Right? Because that's the first thing. Because you know how people are. Right? We're always going to be like, well, we were the first. We were the originals. We're the first ones. Right? And so somehow that always seems to make the people who got there first as if they were more something or other than the new ones. Oh, those are the just the new kids on the block. Those are just the new ones that just come in. Um, we've been here the whole time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's the, you know, it's, we were here first. And what Christ, not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is. That's the focus. The focus is on who Christ is and who Christ has made you to be, made us to be. We are one family, one body in Christ because of what God has done, not what we've done. And so Ephesians is really stressing that because it was really easy for Jews to look at their, their 
up at the Gentiles and say, well, you know, it's easy for the Gentiles to look at like, wow, you guys never learned the lesson. And both of them were looking at each other like, hey, we're better than you are. And Paul's saying, no, that's the wrong lesson to learn. You folks are all together because of what Jesus can we start with that? Let's start with that. Let's start with what Jesus has done. Now, the point is, what are you called to do? You're one. That's the way that is. Um, the end of chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, there's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So the whole business of this is that your doctrinal disagreements um, and all the other kinds of stuff, that isn't what it means to be the body of Christ. And so, even today, when we are far more fragmented as Christians, we are one body of Christ. Us. Right? Roman Catholics, the Baptists, the Evangelicals, the you know, Methodists, every other form of denomination, we're still one body. We're still one church because it's who it's founded on, not what we think, not what we argue. And so this is the very frustrating thing when there are churches out there who say, oh, you can't do this, right? You're not the right kind of Christian. And I think of it as like, it ain't. This is Jesus' church, right? And so if somebody walks in, right, who happens not to be Lutheran, and they come to the table for communion, we say, great, come. Because I'm not the one who's making the decision. Our leadership isn't the one who is saying yes or no. It's Christ. And if I'm going to make a mistake, if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on the side of well, Jesus has got this pretty well sorted out. It seems to be a safer thing to do. But how many times do we hear Christians who are like, oh, you're not the right kind, right? And because you're not the right kind, you don't get to come in the door. Right? I know. I, I know. It, it, where it's like, you know, we're like, really? We're still doing this? I mean, honestly, at this point, and... Well, I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> if we walk into particular brands of Lutheran churches, they would not give us. I, 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 I mean, I'm not saying that they're not going to give us what we want, but I mean, when, you know, I, this is one of those things that I, you know, when um, we traveled to Rome, we were at the Vatican. Did we commune? Yes, we did. I don't care what the Pope says. I don't care what the, the, the sacrament is offered by God, by Christ. The people giving it out, we're just the vehicles, right? We're just, I mean, it's not the priest who makes it efficacious. It's not, you know, God does that. God takes care of that. In our unity, you know, and I'm sure somewhere, somewhere is like, oh, pastor, we probably shouldn't say that all that. Tough. You know, it's just the way it is. Yes, we communed there. And didn't, I didn't feel one iota of guilt about it. Not one. I, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I'm a baptized, believing, you know, member of the body of Christ. Congratulations. Jesus is the one who's the author of all of this. And so here I am, you know. Sometimes. Uptight ushers, man. They'll, they'll be like, oh, yeah. They look at you and like, and I remember one time we were actually there for, for mass. We were way up front of the um, St. Peter's, right? Um, and they were passing out bulletins. Um, and essentially they were figuring that if you couldn't read Latin, then they knew that you weren't really eligible. Now, it was funny because, you know, Denise and I know, uh, you know, her knowledge of the liturgy is even better than mine. 
you know, we know enough liturgy that we could do it in just about any language. If we just give it a head start and a push, we'll be fine, right? But, you know, but it's like, so they were like, yeah, we'll take that. And because Denise and I don't um, present ourselves as Americans when we travel, usually. No, no. Oh, God. If we did that, then they really would have freaked. I'm, or they would have been like, oh, get out. <laughs> no. But what was really interesting is that they just assumed that we were Germans. This happens all the time when I travel. I don't know. Every time I get on an international flight, the nice flight attendant usually speaks to me in German. And I'm thinking, I don't speak a word of German. Not anymore. You know, I, but, but you know what? It always usually gives me better service. And so I'm never, you know, okay, I... It's funny. You but it's just, how human beings have done such a quality job of saying, you're in and, and you're out. Yeah. Because the folk actually get very comfortable He does, yeah. And in, in, yeah, and certain, in, he's got a whole host of folks who do most of the work for him. Not for, we went to, we went to an audience with John Paul II. And we go to the audience just because, because they're fascinating. Yeah, it's a great experience, and we're good Christians, and so we figured, you know. And so, but we're so good at building walls and making separations. And yeah, this really, you know, the United States is still living with not just the the handle of racism, but racism. I mean, it's just we. It's a you know we should be we should be better at. Certain corners of our country and in our politics, they are encouraging it. All over it. Just so, but in here's the saying, no, don't. You know, one more family, you know, and and that's what's really trying to um, they're trying to get across. And what's really interesting is that the the other part of it is that this whole business about being worthy of our call. Um, it's not that we're deserving your thing, it's that there's a certain sense of um, equilibrium that we're to live in the way that God has called us to live. That's what balances the scales, right? It's not because we have the opportunity to do that, right? Because there's nothing that we can do to make it right with God. We cannot justify ourselves because we are, well, <laughs> sinful um, and we fall short. And God says, that's okay. Because, what's that? Yeah, stiff-necked people. And so what does God do? After sending, you know, after all of the frustrations of the Hebrew scripture, what does he do? He sends Jesus. It's like he, he, he not just doubles down. It's like a hundredfold saying, okay, then we're going to go the way of love and we're going to go that direction, right? Wrath, anger, frustration, maybe it didn't work. But God never gives up on us. And so since Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing, of course. That's what we're called to do. We're called to live the way that God called us to live. That it, it, it puts our relationship with God in that kind of thing. So the unity is the first step. Living in unity with other Christians, living in unity with other people, that's the first step. And then what is really drawn out in the second half of the letter, and especially in the text that we get today, is that we've got to use the gifts that we've been given. Right? And, and Paul lists them right away. Humility. Right? And it's like we it's like we skip first two all together. Um, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what we're being called. Those are the things that and we've been given those gifts, right? 
accountability. Cooperation, not competition. Um, and yes, even diversity in our oneness. And here's the interesting thing. Being one in Christ doesn't mean uniformity. We're not supposed to all be the same. But we are supposed to work together. And those are two different things. God's not calling for uniformity. God's not calling us to be the same. In fact, what is the thing that Paul talks about section is he is the variety of gifts that have been given right but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift so grace comes to us because of what Christ does Christ does but then the gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the ministry the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ and so even those who work in the church are a diverse bunch. Each of us has different gifts. Every pastor is not going to be able to do the same things. That's okay, because we live in a diverse, creative, thoughtful, beautiful world that God has created exactly like this. And so each of your gifts is going to be different. That's good, because if you think about it, think about the body, right? And Um, during the Middle Ages, they're going to talk about something called the body politics. And what it means is that in a community, you need every part of the body to make the thing work, right? Um, Paul even talks about this. If we were all an ear, right, how would we taste? If we were all a hand, how we would see? And that's not exactly what he says, but he'd go with me because that's essentially the point. It's, we're all the same thing. We all have different gifts. Body needs all of the different gifts. Well, what is that if not celebrating diversity within the unity? Right? The different giftedness of people, the diversity is the way that God leads. Right? We're not supposed to be all the same. This is not uniformity. And in fact, uniformity is going against God's good creation. That getting us all to be cookie cutter, all look alike, all sound alike, all do the same things, is contrary to the way God created us and the way we've been gifted by Jesus. And so why would we want everybody to be the same? That's the other thing. But, you know. The more traveling that I've done and the more experiences even in the country, why would we want everything to be modern? That, to me, that's, that's, the, you know, that's the thing that stumps me the most because if God created the world, you know, God created the world, God created the world's beautiful diversity and all of our gifts. We need that. Right? And we can't all be the same and wouldn't want to be. I mean, it's the, you know, I can't imagine eating the same food every day. Exactly the same way every day? Yeah, see, there you go. Now, you know, because after a while, and this is where I, again, I have a little sympathy for the, for the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, you know, because they start saying, well, all we've got is this manna to eat. Well, maybe that after a while, even manna has lost its appeal. Right? It's like, well, you know, I liked it for the first 24 days in a row, but now, and, and so what, what, is what we're really getting out of this Ephesians text is that we are one, but we are not uniform, right? We're not all the same. We have different gifts, and we're supposed to use them. Whatever it is. This is a weird thing to say, but I think it's important. God changes, right? And we see that in the, in the scripture. I think that tries 
something that they don't work. Um, and a lot of it is because human beings are, we're a lot more complicated than we probably seem to be, right? Um, and learning how to get us to do the right thing is not easy. And, and I think we can even see that in our own, you know, as parents and as children. We know when our parents, you know, they tried certain things and then you're like, you know what, I don't think that's working. Because if you do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results, right, that's the definition of madness. So I think, right, that, and I think also that God fully understands that our limitations cause our frustration, right? We don't always know. Yeah. That I think balance. I don't think that's a matter of, or at least from my perspective, and I'll go with, with that. Is that I don't think Jeff Bezos is loved by God more than me. I, I you know, I, I think. The same way, and that there are certain gifts that have been given to us, but I also think that Jeff Bezos had more opportunity than me. And I think that's absolutely true in the United States between white and black, right? You know, I was looking, I was watching a program about housing discrimination and how that one thing has created such a chasm of difference between um, inherited built up wealth, right? That just one thing. Well, I don't think God loves black people less than white people, right? I think that God loves us all equally and been, we've been given, you know, that's the same gift. But I think that human beings have twisted and created a system that isn't what God's talking about here. Because in fact, what usually gets the Israelites in the most trouble in the Hebrew scriptures is when they don't take care of people who are less fortunate. And so in this whole business, you know, that, that God, you know, when Paul is talking about it, our job is to uh, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity. The, the idea is that we our job is they don't have. And so we're to use our gifts to build up the whole body. Now, that means that each of us has the gifts. And so, frankly, if we're talking about you know, these super wealthy people, they're just not using their gifts the way they're supposed to. And so, us to be. We're not living a life worthy of our calling if we're sitting on all this amounts of wealth we're not using it to help others, right? Um, that, I think, is the difference, is that I don't think God said, okay, I'm going to give you the gifts and you're going to be wealthy. No, I don't think that's the way it works, because the gifts are really humility, kindness, and all the rest, um, and that what we do with those that makes the difference, right? That's the difference between a person who is living a God has called them to live and not. And so if somebody, if they have more, then they need to use that in ways that help everybody, that lift up. If, if Jeff Bezos wanted to do one good thing, he would, frankly, and he could do it without denting his pocketbook at all. It's just, how about what he pays everybody who works for Amazon? Well, yeah, just or pay taxes, period. Yeah. But, but could you imagine if he just decided that 
because it's the right thing to do, I'm not going to make, you know, my people, you know, the people who work for me, you know, just trying to kill themselves to make a living. I'm actually going to pay them living wage. I'm just, I'm just going to do it. That would be using his gifts. Because, right, and kindness, gentleness, humility, um, those are the things that we're looking for. And so, you know, do that. <laughs> and, and again, that's seeing the bigger picture. That's seeing that our responsibility, our life as Christians is not simply about um, what I get me, um, where I'm at at the end of the race. It's how many people have I brought along with me? How many people have I lifted up in the process? If I've got the ability to do something, then what is being said here is then do that. Which leads to, yeah, go ahead, Jay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, this one went out and did this, but did this one out and did this, but the other one just went out and did it. And so it says, you know, to uh, those who have more and more will be given. So does that kind of like mean that we're also, when we have these talents, we're supposed to be using them and working to uh, provide the uh, increase, more or less, yeah. to those who are. And I think that's I think the, the the parable of the talents is is one of those that can sometimes really catch us off guard. But what, what Jesus is really saying is that if you have talents, use them. Right? You know, that's that's the thing. Um, Jesus wasn't frustrated that the person with the smaller talent had a smaller return. It's that he refused to use the talent. I mean that's really the thing. You know, so if so if I'm gonna, you know, in, so in this particular case, let's, we'll continue to Jeff Bezos because it's easy. Um, but it's like he's been given a lot and doesn't use them. He's like the last person in that story, right? That he's been given a talent. Okay, well, let's say that you and give it to somebody who's actually going to do something with it, right? And so that, I think... <laughs> Well, see, about this a little bit on Sundays. They act out of their scarcity. They're so afraid of not having what they have because they think for a lot of them it's a competition with each other. How big is their checkbook? Not what can they actually do with it. But some see sometimes you got to force people to do the right thing. Um, this is back at the beginning of the 19th century. The Rockefellers and all those other people, they didn't just wake up someday and say, you know what, I'm going to fund libraries or museums all over the place. They didn't. What's that? There was a tax going on the It was called the inheritance tax. They said, if you don't spend that money, we're going to tax it once you die. And they're like, oh, so. And the idea was, Spend the money, right? Because they didn't want to create. What the, the biggest fear in the United States was that they were going to create generational wealth um, and essentially lords, you know, you know, people who inherited titles and land and wealth and never worked for it. And so what they were trying to encourage is like, we'd really like for you to spend all that money. You can give some to your kids. I'm sure a few you know, certain million dollars, they'll be fine. You know, it's, if, if everyone was inherited $10 million when we were born, we, yeah, we'd be all right, right? You could live off the interest, it'd be fine. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not fussy, you know, wouldn't have, but, but what they're saying is like, but the rest of it, it's too much. It's this imbalance. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, do something with that. If you don't spend We'll take it. <laughs> and you know what? They built libraries and museums and concert halls and public arts and all this. That was a good thing. But don't. 
they were encouraged. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of universities. Yeah. Spelman University. And so, see, again. Those universities all have those big endowments because they were the the wealthy people who were like, oh well, it does two things, right? It gets their name out there. What we've done, which is what people have always done. This is why you know you've always um, you've artists, sculptors, and all way to get your name known forever, right? You know, so if you're, you know, names on a university, if you own that building, great, that looks good for you. But it also meant that you weren't paying that in taxes. It's an, it's an enticement. It's an encouragement. And it's both and stick. All right. Which leads us. Yeah, I got to get to the gospel. Um, gospel is really, it's a continuation of last week's, right? Um, we're continuing what are called the bread of life texts. And so what we have is a continuation. And now we're really getting into the bread of life discourse. Time when Jesus really is unpacking what it means that he is the bread of life. And what's interesting is that at the beginning of this, the crowd's going looking for Jesus. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. Um, Jesus walks on water, and they, they're going to look for Jesus. No, of course they're going to look for Jesus. Why wouldn't you? Last time they saw Jesus, he fed 5,000 people, including them, right? And, right, and so they're looking, and what's interesting is that they find him right away. So they sail across the lake, now they're sailing across the lake. And what they get, when they get there, is they just find Jesus himself. All the disciples, Jesus is packed off to a deserted place. So there's this big miracle. Jesus and the disciples disappear. And now only Jesus is found on the other side of the lake. And here's where I think something just absolutely crucial about this text comes in. Jesus says, essentially, um, Jesus I want to make sure I get this exactly right. Um, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, you can read that as Jesus kind of busting their chops. Right, like, yeah, that's nice. You're looking for me. It's a new day, and you're hungry again. Yeah. And they're, you know, and he's probably thinking, they're probably thinking, well, Jesus, what's on the menu for today? Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? And what's really interesting is that Jesus' requirement is just belief. Now, interestingly enough, we know where the gift of belief comes from. It's from the something that we actually do. Faith is worked in us. Telling them is that, well, live as if this actually made a difference. You've been given everything. Now live that way. Um, and it's a really interesting thing because uh, I was last week that I had been reading some um, commentaries from Bishop Craig Satterley from the Northwest Lord Michigan Center, former professor at the school, Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. And he writes, he goes, I think Jesus was disappointed that the crowd did not expect more. Not more bread, something more. Because Jesus said, you're looking for signs, but you're really only coming after me because your bellies are full. And so Jesus, in many ways, is saying, there's more to this story. There's more to me. There's more to God. There's more to this whole thing. 
why aren't you looking for more? All they can see is the fact that they got fed. And what Jesus is, at, is offering them is something so much bigger. A way of life. A way that's different from the constant striving and competition and all of the rest. He's saying, this is a thing that's going to last forever for you. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's not just talking about food, is he? He's talking about a way. And he's talking about salvation. And saying, there's a way to get there, and that's me. And I'm giving it to you. Right? I'm giving you this gift. It should rewrite everything. The whole world, you should wake up this morning, you should have woken up this morning, and everything should have looked different. Because it is. And that's where we're talking about that sometimes our expectation of God is very small. And that that's different. And that's something. You know, and so they have this conversation with, with Jesus. You know, what must we do to perform the works of God? Believe. Believe that I am the one that God sent. And then they said, what sign are you going to perform so that we can? Well, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. And Jesus is like, yeah, God did that, not Moses. Way back then, that God did that, and that God was offering you, when, he, when God was offering you the promised land, it wasn't just the land of milk and honey. It's a way of life. It's a way of living. It's a way of relating to one another. It's that connection that is talked about in the letter to Ephesians. That one. Could you said we're one people, that we worked for each other, that we led with kindness and humility and lifting others up. That's what we, that was our default. That's what Jesus said. You're looking for signs, but you're not It's not big enough. You know? Only the bread of heaven gives life to the world. Give us this bread. And Jesus like, done, done it. I am the bread. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes will never thirst. The way of life, the thing that we always say, we want life to be better. Right? We, we, we want to envision a world where the catastrophes, or at least the, 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 the own goals that we do, the things ourselves, right? The division, the discrimination, the violence, all that kind of stuff. We want there to be a world where those things don't happen. And Jesus is like, got it. It's right here. If we live out of the gifts that have been given to us, that's the world that we'll get. Not perfect, right? Because, well, we ain't. But so much better, so much bigger, so much grander, and essentially what Jesus is saying, you guys, you keep settling for crumbs. You keep looking for crumbs as if that's the, the whole story. And what I'm saying is that it's so much bigger. We could transform the world. But then what do we do? It's never going to happen. And so we push Jesus back into the box that he fits in so that it doesn't upset us. <laughs> because to upset, to, to follow Jesus is to change everything. And even though life is hard, we'll almost take that over what could be. It's the Israelites all over again, isn't it? We're on the way to the promised land. But you know what? 
I don't know where our next step is, and so I guess I'd rather go back to Egypt. Because then at least I knew what was going to happen next. And so we'll sacrifice the promised land for certainty, even though certainty puts us back in chains. Yeah, it's some big stuff, right? I mean, and this is what Jesus is trying to get us to think about. You know, that we keep, we keep settling. Yeah. Yeah, but we do the same thing. I mean, we're, you know, it's like the, the, you know, the people who essentially look at what needs to be done, they're like, yeah, somebody else do it, it's somebody else's problem, you know, and then they, and they may not shake their fist at God anymore, although I think a lot of them still do. Why isn't the world different? And they're looking right at God, like, God, how come you haven't fixed this? And God's looking at us like, I asked the same question. <laughs> you got everything you need. You got everything you need. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, a, it never did in the first place. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then the second part of it is always to me, it's like, why wouldn't we want to share this? Why wouldn't we want to be, why wouldn't we want all people to be involved and, and included and accepted and welcomed? I will never in all of my days understand people who say, you know, folks, why? But you're right. You're right, Judy. That is exactly it. They're so afraid to lose what they have. Don't have that. Don't That's the Jesus. Yeah, right. Well, and, and I remember this. And, and kind of, because it, it made me think of when I was teaching American history, one of the most, the, the things that, Poor Southern whites before the Civil War. They were getting absolutely shut out of the economy of the South because the owners why when you don't have to. And so these poor whites were absolutely getting economically slaughtered, and yet the plantation owners were able to convince them. Oh no, you gotta support slavery. This is good for you. Because then at least there's somebody beneath you. And all I could think of is that's the most horrifying way to look at the world. But I think you're right. I mean, that's the way people you know, I'm in the world of trouble, but at least I'm not it makes no sense. There's no logical reason and there's You know, and this is what Jesus keeps trying to get people to see. You know, my guess is that Jesus today would look at white people and say, Don't you get it? Don't you get it? If you opened, if you were more expansive, you were more inclusive, it would lift everybody. It benefits everybody. You're seeing such a small little thing. But I think that's what happens, is that that they've just shrunk their vision of what could be to the point where they're, they live in nothing but fear. Well, I thought, on that same token, I thought it would be amazing that none of the Republicans voted for the Simmons packet. So I said, there are no poor Republican people that we need some money? Right. How yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. 
You know, anything that makes black people suffer. That's all right. And that, that's, what, that's what gets them, that gets their vote. Yeah. So and that's so stupid. And ultimately, that's what you it is contrary to what Jesus teaches us. Completely. 100%. And Ephesians, right, says, you know, we're one, one body. And so, especially the Christians, those are the people who I, I just, I, I cannot fathom at all that they would do that. So, those are our texts, right? I mean, notice they get all sorts of stuff just comes up. But the theme that I think we want to hold on to then is that even in our own lives, Jesus says, don't you expect more? And so, how are we, what are we doing to limit our vision, right? And then, how can we grow on that? How can we use our gifts to grow beyond that? Um, and then, how do we well? people along on that track? Um, I think that's you know, we know we're the Israelites, but God keeps giving us another opportunity to break out of that. And I think that's, that's probably a good place for us to wrap up for today. Thank you, everybody. Good stuff. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Home. We will see you again next week, and hopefully we'll get my sound system sorted out. So that was a problem. My apologies. We'll do, we'll do better next time. Thanks, everybody.